Please take your Bibles and turn to um, 1 Thessalonians. Hi, Brad. I've been missing you. So, uh, 1 Thessalonians, we're going to look at. It says in, in chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul and Silvanus, or Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, or Thessalonians in, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Making mention of you in our prayers that um, constantly bearing in mind your faith, and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our Father. (laughs) There. Those are the three things that are communicated throughout this epistle. The work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the thing that the Thessalonians had, you know, that he's commending them on and was uh, something that was a, a big part of their, of their fellowship there. It says the same thing in chapter 4, verse 8. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet as a helmet and the hope of salvation. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 also mentions this faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these is charity. These are the three components that are all about the walk that we have as Christians. The work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope. Then in verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Paul didn't just come, Paul and Silas and Timothy, they just weren't there talking about the gospel. They were living the gospel. They were a great example of how you were to live this Christian walk. In other words, they, uh, they exemplified for them what it means to have the work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope. They saw it in Paul and the other men. And it says in verse 6, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. The word that was received in Thessalonica, there was a lot of tribulation. But they watched Paul and they saw how Paul was steadfast in his faith. How he worked that faith and how he was uh, constant in his loving. He labored in love and he was steadfast in hope. And they they imitated him. They followed him. They watched him. They they had his example. So much so, if it says in verse 8, For the word of the Lord has sounded out forth from you, And not only in Mesopotamia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. So what we just read was is that Paul followed Christ, and the Thessalonians followed Paul, and because of their doing that, their great example was to all of those in Greece. Mesopotamia is the northern part of Greece, Achaia is the southern part of Greece, that their faith had spread throughout all of this area uh, because of uh, you know, the great stand that Paul took in, in, in representing to them how to live a Christ-like life. In verse 9, For they themselves report about us what kind of, per- kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait... For his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescued us from the wrath to come. So Paul was tremendous in his dealings with the Thessalonians. And uh, at another time, we'll look in more detail at how he worked specifically with this one church and how he 
how he fathered them and how he mothered them, how he took care of them, how he loved them, and how he gave them a glorious example to follow. And they became imitators of him. And because they were imitators of him, they became examples for the whole, uh, peop all the people in Greece, and, and not only in Greece, but it went so far as throughout the whole world. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, please. Acts, Romans, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul was not only an example to the church at Thessalonica, he was also an example for the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says in verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Paul is the one that took the word to Corinth for the first time, and he fathered them along. Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. Copy me. Let me be your example. I'm, I'm the one that you should imitate. For this reason I have sent Timotheus, or Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. It's, uh, this, this example thing goes on. He says, look, I want you to be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. So I'm sending Timothy to you. You imitate Timothy because Im Timothy has imitated me and I have imitated Christ. Follow the leader. You remember that game when you were kids, right? Simon says, remember? Do you remember? It goes like this. Simon says, raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. Simon says, raise your right hand. Simon says, raise your left hand. Oh, so you do remember this game, right? It's a, sort of a silly game. I didn't say, Simon didn't say, put your hands down. <laughs> Joe won, and all the rest of you put your hands down, you lose. So um, Paul gave a, an excellent example for the Corinthians. He also gave an excellent example for the Thessalonians as to how to live this wonderful life, how to have the work of faith, how to have the labor of love and the steadfastness of hope. Everything that Paul did was for the glory of God, always endeavoring to win one soul for the glory of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 24, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. 1 Corinthians 10, 25, eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all, and all it contains. You can eat whatever you want. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, Eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean not for your conscience, but for the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks. What he's saying to, he, what he's saying to us is, you know, all, everything that you know, God provides on the earth is you can eat it, go ahead and eat it. But if you are invited to someone's house and they, this, they offer you food and then they tell you that this food was offered to an idol, don't eat that food because it will, it will verify to them or it will say to them that you are in support of their worshiping a false god and eating food that is offered to a god. So for their conscience sake, don't eat it. Verse 31, whether then you eat or drink, or whether you do or do all to the, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. 
Just as I also pleased all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they might be saved. Paul's saying, I'll do whatever is needed to be done in order to win one soul. And if my eating of meat is going to offend that person and lead them away from accepting Christ, I won't eat meat. Or whatever it takes, whatever I have to do, whatever sacrifice, whatever is necessary, I am willing to do it. And then he goes on in chapter 11 to say, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. You be the same. Do as I have done. Be willing to sacrifice and to surrender any right that is yours in order to win another person. Paul was such a great, great example for us. In Philippians chapter 3, and that's the thing about Paul's witness or his, his lifestyle, it's written in the scriptures. So it's something that we can continue to emulate. We can continue to copy Paul, his example, because it is written throughout the book of Acts and all the church epistles so that it's a written standard that every believer to this day can look at him and say, okay, that's the way you do it. Obviously, you can do the same with Jesus. But a lot of times, you know, because Jesus walked a perfect life without sin, it, you know, maybe be a little bit more difficult for us to, to assimilate that. But Paul was, a, was like you and like I. We know Paul was a great sinner. And, and you know, yet he repented and he lived that life. And, and here he is, God is saying that he is a great example for us to imitate, imitate <laughs> emulate. I'm trying to get two words out at the same time. In Philippians chapter 3, you know, it's, it's uh, or did we look at Corinthians? Yeah, we did. Philippians chapter 3. I, I was thinking of this in, in light of uh, the example, how important it is to have examples of how to do stuff. I'm, I'm the kind of person that learns by watching much better than by reading or by studying. I, I learn that way too, but the, for me, the greatest way of of, of learning is to be able to watch. Uh, I remember as a youth, uh, I had, I, I always enjoyed working as a young, as a, as a child and so on, but I never really had an example of how you were supposed to work, I, 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 you know, diligently and stay with the job until it was finished. Until I was about 18, 19 years old, I got a job at a, uh, uh, a floor installing place where, you know, you install linoleum and carpets and tile and that thing. And I, I worked with this guy named Hugo, who was, uh, he was uh, from Germany, and uh, he was a very hard, hard-working man. And Hugo gave me a, an incredible example of how a man was really supposed to work. I mean, he was at work every day on time, and when we got to the job, there was no messing around. There was nothing. We worked, and we worked hard, and we kept with it, and we stayed with it. And, and you know, it was such a great example to me. And then later on when I got into uh, Christianity, I went away to uh, the Waco or Bible College type of thing, and, and there were men, there was a work-study program. We worked four hours a day, and we studied four hours a day. And the men that I worked with, men like George Jess, uh, Gene Randall, and other people that I worked with, they gave me such a wonderful example of, of how to work and how to work hard and to, and to not stop until the job was done. And, you know, it, it changed my character because I watched and I saw their example. I was, I'm thinking of this because of yesterday I, when we, we had the work day. You know, when, when my children were growing up, uh, our five children, Sean, don't ever do that again. That wasn't funny at all. Uh, that uh, yeah, it was a little funny. That was, I thought that was pretty good. It was good. Uh, your wife didn't think it was funny. <laughs> So uh, what, I, what I did purposely, now, now I had a work ethic, and I knew how to work hard, and I taught my children how to do that. You know, we would, we would uh, I'd get them to work with me around the house and, and so that they could learn to work hard. And I was watching my, my sons yesterday, and, and indeed they were working very hard around here as we were working, and I, I was thinking how wonderful it was is that their children were watching them work. And they got to see the example of how their dads worked hard and they, you know, they, they kept on working, they did the job, and it gave them an example. And that's just really what we're talking about here. I had someone that was an example for me that I followed that helped me to change, and then I became that example for my children so that they could, be, they could learn. There's a lot of people that don't know how to work and work hard. 
You know, somebody has to teach you how to do that. And, and they, they learned how to do that, and now they're teaching their children. And that's how the Word of God grows, and that's how, that's how you learn how to do this. That, you, that you have, you're shepherded, and you watch other people that have gone before you, that have, they have learned how to have the work of faith. Faith isn't easy. It's hard to be obedient. It's hard to stay with it. It's hard to, and, and to have someone to, to magnify that for you, to give you an example of that is wonderful. And the labor of love, it's, it's nice to talk about love and write poems about love and sing songs about love, but it sure as hell is, it's, it sure is hard <laughs> to, <laughs> I'm having a hard time with my words today. It can be hard at times to manifest that love to an unloving person. And, and uh, to see somebody else do that gives you a great example. And the steadfastness of hope when the whole of life is caving in and you're depressed and you're not feeling well, to think and to have someone that's in front of you that's saying, you know, Christ is coming back. This song we just sang isn't just a song, it's a reality. We live in light of, of that coming kingdom. And to have that... To have that illustrated for us is what Christianity is all. That you have sort of a, someone that sponsors you along the way, someone that shepherds you along the way. In Philippians chapter 3, in verse 12, Not that I have already obtained it. This is the Apostle Paul again speaking to the church at Philippi. We, we see how he was an example for those at Thessalonica. He was an example for those at um, Philippi, uh, Corinth and now here at Philippi. In uh, verse 12, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forth forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the gold for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Do you remember when Sean taught this two weeks ago, that, that woman that you know, won the race and that she, she totally expended herself? She went to the finish line. And Paul is saying, I'm that way. I'm, I'm living my life to its absolute maximum. When you read chapter 1 of Philippians, it's really a, it's, it's an incredible thing. We learn that Paul is in jail and, and that he is, he is at the place in his life that, uh, you know, being in jail at any time is not a good thing. Being in jail at the time in the first century church where there is no elect electricity, there is no plumbing like we know. I mean, this, is a, this was an extremely difficult situation for Paul. And Paul says to him, you know, I'm at the place in my life that I, I just as soon die and be with Christ than go on. Uh, you know, he was getting on in age, he was older in life, he had experienced a lot of things. This is the guy that went through so much, he had suffered so much, and had, and had endured and went on and went on and went on. And, you know, he's getting older, he's getting tired, he says, you know what, I would really rather just go ahead and go to sleep, and then the next thing you know, I'm with Christ. I see Christ at his return. But I'm straight betwixt too. I also have a desire to continue to serve you and to love you. And talking to the Philippians, I want to continue to be an example for you. I continue to be a servant for you. And he says to them, well, here's what I've decided to do. He's telling them his thought process. Here's what I've decided to do. I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to keep my eye on the hope, but I'm going to keep on serving and giving and not, let, and not quit. What a wonderful example for the people at Philippi. I press on towards the high calling. He didn't give up. He kept on keeping on. And this is, you know, as, again, as, as young people, and uh, Mimi and I, we were, we were surrounded with, not surrounded, but we had, we had men that, that, that live that kind of life. We have people that, we, we, that gave us this, there's two examples. I probably told you about this before, but uh, this one man in particular uh, who I refer to as my Uncle Harry, when he was dying in the hospital, and Mimi and I went to pray for him and uh, to be with him, you know, and, and, uh, and we got there and he, said, he calls us to his bed and he says to us, don't worry about me, kids. I've looked steadfast into heaven. I've seen the glory of God and Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the throne of God. I'm okay. Let me pray for you. And he prayed for us. 
and the next day he died. He finished the race all the way to the end. What an example to me. You know, now that I'm older in my years and I can see the finish line coming in 30 years or so, that, uh, you know, I can keep on keeping on. And also George Jess did the same thing to me. George was on, the, on his last legs. He, was, he had this operation that wasn't a success and he's at the end of his life and his wife asked me if I would come and pray for him. And, I, and, and uh, Bernita, she says, when I, when I get there, she says, to, she says to George, George, Vince is here. He's here, he's here to pray for you. And, and George, is, I, he was the one I was telling you about that helped me years earlier to learn how to work. Really a wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't pre-think this. <laughs> There's an emotional connection there, because George meant so much to me. And, and uh, so Benita asked me to pray for him, and she tells George that I'm here to pray for her, for him. You know, I'm a young, I'm a young you know, uh, bold minister at this time, so I thought, you know, I was a young whatever. <laughs> so George looked over me. George could barely talk. He was definitely on his last legs. He was probably less than 100 pounds. He looked over at me and, and smiled, and grabbed my arm, and prayed for me that God would bless my life. And again, that week he died. These are men that I've seen not give up, not give in. They pressed on. The steadfastness of hope, the quality of life, that was the example that was given to me. And we have the written example of the Apostle Paul. He was just that way right here in the book of Philippians. You know, I would really like to die, he says, but I'm not going to. I'm going to continue to serve for you. What a wonderful, wonderful example. Verse 14 again, I press on toward the goal for the prize, for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. We should have the same attitude that Paul had. Verse 16, however, let us keep living by the same standard to which you have obtained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. For many walk of whom I've often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. He said, look, follow my example. Don't follow these other guys. Make a comparison of the life that they're living with the life that I have lived in front of you. And again, Paul, Paul in particular, his standard is a written standard. It's one that, you know, that is here that we can see clearly. You compare, you know, the people that are, are being motivated by their own stomach and their own power and their own desire, and you look at Paul and then you follow his example. And now we're not talking about how Paul combed his hair. We're not talking about how he weighed, you know, the clothes that he wore. We're not talking about his personality or his sense of humor or his idiosyncrasies. We're talking about the way that he had that work of faith, that labor of love, that steadfastness of hope, the lifestyle that he had is the one that we are to emulate. Look at Philippians chapter 4. In verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is repute, what, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things, the things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I just, I, I, I just, I love that. He gives us this wonderful example. I couldn't help but to think about uh, this old poem that says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Find counsel is confusing, but an example is always clear. And the best of all preachers are the men who live their creeds. 
For to see put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you will let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. I wish I had Brad up here to give me the example of how to do this. <laughs> and the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Look at Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. This is when Paul first went to Philippi. So you go back, you look at the book of Acts, and you see the example that he set. It's extraordinary indeed. Acts 16, verse 6. And they passed through Phrygian and Galatian region, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. The thing about Paul, and the reason that he was worthy of, uh, of being an example is because he followed Christ. And here he is, he's, he's moving through the, this is Turkey, he's going to start in the eastern part of Turkey, and he's going to work his way all the way through to the west of Turkey. And he's, at, he's passing through these regions, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. The Holy Spirit said, you don't speak the word anywhere, which was unlike Paul. He, everywhere he went, he spoke, but the Spirit of God led him. He was led by the Spirit of God, which we're going to look at in detail next weekend. He, and, and it said, don't speak. Verse 7, and after they came to Messiah, they, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Jesus said, no, you can't go to Bithynia. I don't want you to go there. Paul was led by Christ. He was led by the, you know, it talks about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Jesus. They're the same. They're one and the same. It's just calling it a different thing. It's Christ in you. It's Christ. Jesus, you know, is working with us. And he, Paul's great example was he didn't go about doing things on his own. He didn't decide, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to this place and start moving the Word. No, 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 no. He did what the Holy Spirit told him to do. The Holy Spirit said, don't speak the Word in Asia. Keep on going. And when he wanted to go to this one place, he asked, and, and Jesus said, no. That's not what you do. Paul's great example was is that he was a follower of Christ. He did what Christ said to do. And again, that's that, that class that we were talking about earlier, that's really the, the essence of experiencing God, is that you pursue a constant love relationship with Him that is, that is real and you know, personal. And, and this is your life, your, your love relationship with Him. And you're communicating with Him. And you're looking to see where He's at work in the world. What is He doing? Well, in this situation, Paul is, is praying. You know, he's got all this time. He's walking all across Asia, all across Turkey. He's walking and he's praying. He's, he's mindful of God. He's aware of God. He's, he's, you know, he's cognizant of God and he's communicating. And he's saying, you know, I'd like to speak the word here. No. You don't speak the word. I like to go up to Bithynia. No, you don't go up there. And he's obeying. This is the example that we have. In verse, verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, he immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So after all of this time, and I can't imagine how long it would take to walk all the way through Turkey. I'm, you know, it's a long distance. And he finally he sees a vision, and the vision says, come over to Macedonia, which is Greece. That meant he had to go over the Aegean Sea and to go in. So now he's being led by the Spirit. He's, now they're assuming, well, there's got to be some people there in Macedonia for us to speak to. And then uh, when we, we verse 12, 10, when we had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. Verse 11, so putting out to sea from Troas, we ran straight across to Samotracia and on the, on the following day to Napolis. 
and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside of the gate to the riverside, where we were supposing that we would be, there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Here we again see, uh, you gotta, when, you, when you contemplate this record and you really think about it, you've got to love what it is saying to us. And that is, Paul started out in the, in the very far east part of Turkey. And being led by God, led by the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church, he goes all the way across Turkey, hundreds of miles, by foot. Not an easy journey. When he wanted to speak the word in these different places, he said, no, no, no. And he got all the way up to the northern coast of where, I guess it would probably be where Istanbul is today. On the coast, all the way to the north, and up there he gets this vision to go over into Europe. He goes over, he crosses over the sea, which again, this isn't, we're not taking a cruise ship across here. This is a difficult journey. He gets to the other side. He, the first place he comes to, nothing's happening. The second place he comes to, nothing's happening. In these there days, he goes out by the river, and there's just this one woman, Lydia, who isn't even from Philippi. She's from, she's from back in Asia. Uh, but she, this one woman, and it says that God opened up, what's it say? The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken of by Paul. What this whole thing says to me is one soul, one person, is worth all the effort that Paul, and Paul ain't alone. He's traveling with Luke, he's traveling with Silas, and Timothy might be there too. These, all these guys are traveling so that they can win this one woman. The first believer in Europe, Lydia. How important is one soul to God? And how important should one soul be to us? I mean, if, I was talking to Sean about this the other day. If, if my whole life is lived, from, from the time that I accepted Christ until the day that I fall asleep, if I, if I live 50 years or 60 years or 70 years, and in that time frame I win one soul, I have an influence, I don't win any souls, but if I have an influence on one soul who the Lord wins and that one soul ends up in the kingdom and has eternal life, my whole life would have been worth it. Sure it would have. For one soul to live for eternity? I mean, what's the price of that? It's just wonderful. So verse 15, and when, when she, this is the example that Paul has given us, someone that is led by Christ. That's what he didn't say. He said, follow me as my ways are in Christ. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And it happened as they were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her master's much profit by fortune telling. So this slave girl, she was demonized, and because she was demonized, she was able to tell fortunes. She, was, uh, she could read horoscopes and tell fortunes and do that kind of thing, and she was making lots of money for her owners. In verse 17, following after Paul and us, so you see that's Luke we know was there, and, Tim, and uh, Silas, and she kept crying out, saying, these men are the bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Now, you know, the first time that she did that, you know, it might have been a little bit flattering to Paul. These men are the bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. That might not have been bad, but when she kept on doing it, over and over, and wherever Paul's walking, these are the men of the Most High God. These are the men of the Most High God. These are the men of the Most High God. Oh, shut up! <laughs> Verse 18, she continues this for many days, 
And Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it came out of her that very moment. It wasn't, who, who got the spirit out of her? The Lord Jesus got the spirit out of her. He commanded in the name of the Lord Jesus and the spirit obeyed, you know, with the authority of Christ. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and proclaiming customs which are not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. And the crowds rose up against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Then about midnight, Paul and Silas are like, they're like this. What is this, God? I mean, you had me walk all the way across Turkey? I had to go all this way. It took months for me to do this. And I crossed over and I got one woman. I go get a second woman. I get beaten with rods and here I'm in prison. Boy, it's really great being a Christian. Thanks a lot. (laughs) Is that what Paul did? About verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. You know, there's no lights, it's midnight, these two guys are singing, and they're praising God. This is the example that he gave to the church that was at Philippi, when he said, follow me. And then verse 26, and suddenly there came a great earthquake, as coincidence would have it, so that the foundations of the prison's house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. And you know how those earthquakes work, that when you're in jail, the doors just fly off, open, and your chains automatically fall off with an earthquake. That's sarcasm to me. And so um, God worked in this thing, and the jailer awoke, and saw the prison doors open, and he threw his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do do not harm yourselves, for we are all here. And he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling and with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. and, And after he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what did he say? What must I do to be saved? Again, you could see constantly the Spirit of God leading and Paul following. And because of that, Paul could say, look, as you have seen me do this, the believers at Philippi, who were the believers at Philippi? It was Lydia. It was this, this, this girl that used to be a fortune teller. It was uh, this guy, uh, the jailer. I'm, I'm sure Lydia had a fellowship in her home. We'll see later on that he goes back there. And then uh, the jailer, I'm sure, started, this is the believers. He said, now you remember how I was when I was with you. You be the same way. Someone that was head over heels in love with God and someone that obeyed and followed the direction. And then in chapter 17, and when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's customs, he went into them For three Sabbath days, reasoning with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had suffered and risen again from the dead, saying, "This, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking some Wicked men from the marketplace. I like the way the King James says it better. Lewd fellows of the baser sort. (laughs) 
lewd fellers of the baser sort. These are the guys in my, I used to hang around with before I got in the Lord. <laughs> Wicked men from the marketplace. They formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason, was welcomed, Jason was, has welcomed them, and they have all acted contrary to the degrees of Caesar. Lies, lies, lies. Saying all that there is another king, Jesus. It wasn't about contrary to Caesar. It was about speaking the truth, that Jesus is the Messiah, the king. They stirred up the crowd and the city and the authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. This is Paul's time in Thessalonica. And then it goes on to say in verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they had arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many brethren, many of them believed, along with a number of the prominent Greek women and men. And when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. So again, we, we, we see another example of how Paul was when he went to the church at Thessalonica. It, there was difficulty. It was hard. There was persecution. But Paul, Paul's steadfastness, the way that he believed, he, his, labor of, his labor of love, his work of faith, his steadfastness in the hope was their example. And that's what he's saying to them. Follow that. Be imitators of that. And, uh, and so on. So on it goes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for having the example of a man like Paul and that um, we can too love you and be loved by you and seek you in all that we do and be led by you. Thank you that Christ is the head of the church, not any man, but that Christ is the head of the church and he lives within us and we can have the same kind of communication where we're being led and guided by you so that we can follow the leader. I thank you so much for your grace and your kindness and your goodness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.